Hey everyone, it's Phil Frost from Main Street ROI. And I want to welcome you to today's training called How to Use Cold Email Outreach to Generate New Clients and Partnerships. All right, here's some housekeeping. I always encourage questions throughout the presentation. If you have a question, just post that to the Q&A box, or I think it's labeled questions in the GoToWebinar uh, little widget there. It should be in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, and I'll address those as they come in. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's relevant to that slide, and if I can, and uh, if I don't get to it, we'll get to it in the uh, live Q&A at the end. <clears throat> I always recommend you turn off distractions, uh, especially email and, uh, and Facebook. You'll get the most out of this if you're not trying to uh, also multitask and get through emails. And then I do have a quick poll. I see someone found the questions box there. Ryan asked, will we receive a recording of this via email? Yes, we do record this. And uh, we typically send it out the same day. We've been pretty good about sending it out uh, the night of the uh, the webinar. But if not tonight, then uh, tomorrow. I usually say within about 24 hours. All right, so I just have a couple questions here. So you should see a poll on your screen that says, I am A. And uh, there are four options there, small business owner, marketer, add a small business, consultant or agency serving small businesses, or a consultant or agency serving all business sizes. And it looks like 50% have voted at this point. <clears throat> Let me just give it a minute here. Not even a minute, just, uh, just a couple, couple more seconds. We're up to almost 70% have voted. So I'm going to close it out in three, two, one. I'll actually share that just so you can see who's on the line here. You can see 22% small business owners, 44% marketers, uh, close to 20% consultants serving small businesses, and about 15% consultants or agencies serving all business sizes. Uh, next question here is uh, are you currently working with a marketing agency? And then obviously if you are an agency or consultant, we do have an option there. All right, looks like 60% have voted. So I'll close this out in three, two, one. Pretty uh, interesting, well I guess, I will share that as well. Uh, based on the previous question, we do know that a lot of uh, agencies and consultants are on the line here, 40%, uh, and then 16% of the businesses on the line are working with a agency, and 40%, 44% are not. And the last question, and then we will get moving here, is to get a sense for which digital marketing channels are you currently using? The options here are Google AdWords or Bing advertising, Facebook advertising, email marketing, social media, or other. And if you do choose other, uh, I always like to see what uh, you are doing. So if you could just post that into the questions box. <clears throat> Looks like uh, majority are using advertising here. And I always love to see the stats for email marketing. It looks like 71% using email marketing. That's great. All right, let me close this out in three, two, one. And I did see uh, Bridget, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, said you, you're using uh, direct mail since you selected other. Um, and uh, I'll share this as well, and then we'll get moving here. You can see majority of people using Google AdWords and Bing ads. A uh, good amount, 42% using Facebook ads, 71% using email marketing. I love to see that. 58% using social media and 13% other. All right, a little bit about Main Street ROI. If this is your first training, you're probably wondering who the heck we are. Our mission is to empower businesses to be successful, for, uh, obviously, with digital marketing. We, both, we provide both services and training. 
So we provide services like SEO, Google AdWords, Facebook advertising, email marketing, and we also provide a lot of training, uh, tons of free information on our blog. We have a free email newsletter that we publish uh, every week, and then we have uh, paid courses that go more in-depth on a particular marketing channel or tactic, <clears throat> and then we also provide one-on-one -on -one consulting. And you're probably wondering who the heck am I? Again, my name is Phil Frost. I'm the founder of Main Street ROI. And uh, I already mentioned we provide digital marketing services and training. And to date, we've helped over 2,000 businesses with their digital marketing. And my thought leadership has been featured in Forbes, Inc., Amex, as well as Mashable. And I'm also a very proud father of two cute kids here. We've got Violet on the left. She's four and a half. Well, well past four and a half. She's actually going to be uh, five in January. We've got Chubby Emmett on the right. He's two and a half. <clears throat> and uh, my beautiful wife, Erin, in the middle. And this picture was taken on Emmett's second birthday. So he's actually chubbier than that now. I can barely hold him. And uh, you can see some of his friends in the mirror there in the background. All right, so let's dive in. How to use cold email outreach to generate new clients and partnerships. Here's what we're going to cover. First, I want to give an overview of the two types of email, email marketing. Just to clarify that, there's a lot of confusion around this uh, you know, term email marketing. Uh, it's actually uh, bigger than you think. Uh, is cold, out, cold outreach right for you? I'll talk about the two situations where it makes the most sense. Then I'll walk through six steps to cold outreach success. <clears throat> I do have a special offer for attendees at the end. And I already mentioned we'll have live Q&A. All right, so the two types of email marketing. So when you say you're doing email marketing, it actually uh, leaves room for the question, you know, what, what kind of email marketing are you actually doing? Are you doing in-house warm email marketing? And if you're not familiar with what that is, that's where you're sending newsletters and promotional emails to your own list, so your in-house email list. Uh, another phrase that you've probably come across is permission-based marketing. And they say it's permission-based because those folks have likely opted in and requested information. Typically, they'll opt in on your website or maybe if you go to uh, trade shows or conferences and you have a booth, you could be collecting business cards and people are you know, basically requesting information from you and they already know you when you're sending those emails. So it's emails to people who know you or have opted in. And then when I say cold email outreach, really it's just emails to people who do not know you yet. <clears throat> so if you're doing email marketing now you're doing and you're doing uh, in-house warm email marketing, that's great. Uh, and that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're actually going to talk about cold email outreach where we are identifying people who are not yet on your email newsletter or your email list and you're going to reach out to them uh, and, and, and try to drive leads or try to uh, form a partnership. And that's what we're talking about today. Okay, so you might be, might be wondering, is cold email outreach right for you? It's not actually the best tactic for every business. And the, where we found the most success is generating leads for B2B companies, so business to business, where uh, uh, you uh, provide services or products to businesses. <clears throat> now, if you are a business to consumer, uh, company, then what you can use cold email outreach for is to form partnerships. And we've, we've had some success with that as well, reaching out to other businesses to form a partnership, maybe a referral relationship where uh, they are already targeting your ideal customers. <clears throat> you can form a, a partnership and they can then refer their customers over to you. So those are really the, the two situations where We've seen success. Um, if you are a business to consumer company, uh, I don't generally recommend going out and uh, 
doing cold email to consumers to try to try to drive sales. Uh, have, I have not seen uh, that to be successful. All right, so here are the six steps to cold outreach success. The first step here is to identify your criteria. This is arguably the most important step, and I would say a lot of people skip this. <clears throat> but you need to figure out who exactly are you trying to reach. And in marketing, you've probably heard about creating your customer persona, where you list the different criteria that makes an ideal customer for your business. That's really the, the first step. So you want to create that customer persona and then take that a step further. What would make them qualified? And that might be, so if you're reaching out to a business, it might be the industry that they're in, the size of that company, maybe number of employees, maybe it's the job title of the person that you would actually want to talk to or that your sales team would want to talk to. And then take that a step further and think about what would make them unqualified. So one thing that would make them unqualified is they already have a solution to the problem that you address. <clears throat> Maybe they're using a uh, competitor's solution. Maybe they're already your customer. You would obviously uh, not want to be reaching out to your existing customer list to try to sell them. Um, so these are obviously just a couple ideas. You would want to list all the different criteria that makes a particular business and a particular contact that you would talk to qualified and what would make a business and that person that you would talk to unqualified. So that would that definitely takes some brainstorming. You wanna document all of that criteria and then move on to step two, which is building your list. So that, now that you know who you're trying to reach we can think through how to reach them. And you really have two options here. You can manually build the list yourself, and we've seen a lot of success with this. There are tons of directories online. So you can just go scrape the directories. You can do that manually. If you're a programmer or you have a programmer on staff, they can write programs to actually scrape directories for you. That can save you a lot of time. Some examples would be Yelp. So Yelp is a, a great directory, a great resource, and you can um, filter Yelp's results based on industry and different criteria. And then I threw this other one in here <clears throat> just because it's pretty random. It's a welding, it's a welding uh, membership. Um, let me actually click on this, or let's see. Sorry, I can't actually click on that, but um, basically it's a, you'll get this, these slides. It's a member directory, pretty random, but we did uh, outreach for a client that wanted to target um, welding companies, and we literally found a welding directory, and I believe they had about uh, 70, maybe 100 companies in that directory. So it's a gold mine. If you, are, uh, if you wanted to partner with welding companies, or you serve that particular industry, you can find these directories online and then uh, uh, just scrape that information. What I mean by scrape is literally just copy and paste that information that's on the website, put that in a, in a spreadsheet, and now you've got the, the business information to reach out. <clears throat> Option number two is to buy a list from a list broker. Uh, that's a little bit more straightforward you literally just go to a list broker like this one here. Um, this is one that we use and would recommend. We don't have any uh, relationship with them, but it's mountaintopdata.com. You can go check out uh, that website. Um, and they're, they're super helpful, super friendly. You can uh, reach out to a broker, <laughs> explain who you're trying to target, and then they'll be honest with you as far as, you know, we can reach them or we can't actually reach that particular criteria, but maybe you'd be interested in this other criteria. So they'll work with you and uh, you can determine if they can, uh, if they already have a list of who you're trying to target. <clears throat> as far as um, costs are concerned, obviously if you're buying the list, there can be um, a 
pretty substantial cost there in the neighborhood of let's say a thousand to to two thousand dollars depends on the criteria depends obviously on the number of contacts that you're going to buy um, but I, a lot of those list brokers have minimum buys and that's why I would say it, you know expect to be in the neighborhood of a thousand dollars because there's typically that minimum but then manually building it <clears throat> you know you could uh, do a little bit of research find a directory get that information in a matter of you know a couple hours and uh, and be well on your way and, and that's not going to cost you very much okay so now we know who we're, who we're targeting we've we've compiled that list either manually or you purchased it and at this point you definitely don't want to skip this step so you don't want to just send the same message to everyone that's on that list whether you buy it or you compile it yourself <clears throat> you want to take the time to segment your list and that's because you'll get a much stronger response if you tailor the message specifically to the different segments in your list and there's endless ways that you could segment but just some couple ideas uh, would be based on industry and that way, when you're reaching out with uh, with your your email and your message, you can reference that industry. You can maybe reference your experience in that industry. That obviously makes it much more relevant and much more compelling to the person receiving that message. You can uh, tailor it and segment based on job title, and that can be important depending on uh, you know who you're talking to. You want to make sure you're using the appropriate language <coughs> excuse me and make sure for example you might speak different uh, speak differently to the C level audience the CEO or CFO at a company uh, and you might use different benefits for C level uh, contacts versus you might be you know, also have a want to target uh, foreman at a manufacturing company so the foreman's going to have different uh, needs and, and, and desires, and you'll want to address that and make sure you're obviously talking their, uh, their lingo when you're reaching out to them. And then the third idea here would be to segment based on the product or service that you're going to actually offer. And that's pretty straightforward based on you know, what it is that you're going to offer. You would have a different message um, and make sure you segment your list appropriately. <laughs> you might also combine these. So based on the industry and the person and job title that you're targeting, you might actually have a different product or service that you're going to offer. So based on all three of those, you may need to segment your list accordingly so that the offer makes sense. Uh, Jenna just reached out and said can't hear anything <clears throat> which is always concerning when I'm pretty far into the presentation uh, can someone else just type in to the questions box if you can hear me okay Rick Jeff Lauren thank you uh, Jenna <clears throat> not sure what's going on but it sounds like a uh, technical problem on your end all right, um, we will move on. I appreciate all the feedback. Okay, step four, we've got the we've got the list. We've segmented it appropriately. Now you're going to draft the email sequence or sequences, and I put that in plural because you'll likely have you'll need different sequences because you'll have multiple segments. So each segment in your list gets a different email sequence. And here's some key areas in the email that you need to think through. The first one being the sender name. I generally recommend using a person. Um, in, in most cases, this is the, the best way to go about this, having a person reach out versus having the company name. Um, I don't know about you, but personally, when I get emails from a person, I tend to treat those differently 
then when a email comes in and the sender name is a company name, <clears throat> I'm kind of trained to to ignore that email or go into it kind of with that feeling. Uh, this is you know junk email. I don't really have to pay attention to it. So when it comes from a person, people generally are not thinking. They're not in that mindset that they can actually ignore this email. <clears throat> and the next most important element of your email is going to be the, the subject line. <clears throat> so really combine the sender name and the subject line determines whether or not your email is actually going to get opened. And we could argue uh, which one is more important. I tend to think sender name is more important than the subject line. And my argument is always the same, regardless of what the subject is. If you see an email from one of your best friends uh, or an email from uh, your mom or a family member, it really doesn't matter what that subject line is, you're going to open it. <coughs> so I do believe sender name is extremely important for open rates, which then leads to response rates. And then... Uh, Pretty, pretty equally important though is the subject line. And the, the key takeaway here, what we found works best is a direct, descriptive, benefit-focused subject line. <clears throat> the, the key here being, don't try to get too, <clears throat> too fancy or too cute with your subject line. Uh, especially don't, uh, don't use a uh, deceptive subject line where you know you're promising something and then they open it up and it's not actually what you promised in that subject line <clears throat> what that tends to do is get the uh the, the person who's receiving that email upset frustrated annoyed you just wasted their time which leads to spam complaints and that's really the, the killer here in an email outreach campaign you want to avoid people clicking on spam and uh and giving a negative signal to the internet service provider, because what that does is it, it drops your deliverability, and if that happens a lot, you'll actually, uh, your future emails will go directly into people's spam folders. Just be careful with your subject line. And then in your email body, you wanna make sure you have credibility. So remember, these are going out to people who do not know you, <clears throat> so they're First reaction, at, if you get them to open the email, they're going to start reading. Immediately, they're going to be looking for credibility indicators. So is this a legit business or is this just some scammer? And I don't know about you, but I get a lot of emails where I open them up and they're formatted very strangely, different font sizes and colors, and it just looks weird. And I know right away, this is not a legitimate business, and I just I delete those emails right away. So you, credibility is huge. Uh, you know, make sure it, it looks like a regular email. It's not formatted strangely. And then right away, you want to address and overcome the credibility hurdle. And you can do that ideally by referencing uh, some marquee clients that you've worked with. Uh, that can work very well, and you certainly would want to get that in the email very early, early on, and say that you've worked with X, Y, and Z in this industry, and, and they've seen great results. <clears throat> right away, that puts down the guard where the, the person is not uh, trusting you at first. Then you kind of earn that trust with the credibility, and then whatever you say after that, they'll actually read and continue to uh, to read that email. And that can lead to your key selling points. So obviously once you overcome the credibility hurdle, <clears throat> you wanna get into your key selling points, what makes you unique, why, why buy from your business versus every other uh, competitor out there. It gets into your unique selling proposition. And then last but not least, you want to have a strong call to action. You do want them to take some action from receiving that email. And the easiest thing that you can get them to do 
you may be thinking, click a link, but it's actually to click reply. Because with, with email, we're all trained when you receive an email, the next logical step is to reply to that email. So you want to kind of go with the flow here with your cold email outreach. You send an email, have them just say explicitly reply for XYZ, and that would be the, the call to action. <clears throat> I do see some questions coming in here before I get to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jeff, I have heard that plain text performs better than fancy HTML with images. Do you agree that is true? That is a very frequently asked question. And with cold email outreach, <clears throat> the way I've seen it work best is again with a with the sender name is an actual person, <clears throat> and the email looks like a, a direct one-to-one -one regular text email. That's where I've seen the, the strongest response. Now, when you start getting into <clears throat> fancy HTML creatives and images, <clears throat> that can work well for your in-house email newsletter and promotions. Um, but, and you can, you can kind of, it's very similar to when you're surfing around online, <clears throat> there's a, a term called banner blindness. So over time, if you surf around online and you see a lot of ads, you basically become blind to those ads and you don't see them at the, across the top and along the sidebar. Uh, a similar thing happens with email. When you see fancy uh, HTML, uh, fancy imagery in the email, immediately you think this is an advertisement, I can ignore it, <clears throat> it's not worth my time, just click delete versus a personal one-to-one -one email, we're, we're trained the opposite, where we think, hey, this is actually an important thing, I do need to read it, it's not fancy and imagery, it's not an advertisement, this is someone actually taking the time to write me a personal message, I should read it. <coughs> Excuse me. So Jenna, when I say sender name, I'm literally talking about the name that shows up in your email inbox. So if I sent you an email, Jenna, <clears throat> it would show up as Phil Frost as the sender name. And most emails show the sender name and then they so show the subject. <clears throat> and then you use those two, uh, two elements of the email to determine whether or not you're going to open that email or not. Uh, so the email address is separate, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and uh, I, I will get to that in a minute, but I actually do recommend a, uh, a, a person's name for the email address as well versus using like a generic info at company.com um, because, again, that can show up in the email inbox. And right away, that triggers our, our banner blindness. <clears throat> we see a, a company email address. We think we can just ignore that. It's not worth our time versus a personal email. We're going to get stronger response rates because you're going to tend to think that's, that's actually an important email. <clears throat> All right, I'm just getting a bunch of questions here. I wanna make sure get this addressed before we move on. <clears throat> All right, Callie, I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. Um, and Daphne, if you can clarify your question, I didn't totally understand that. And in the meantime, I will move on. So I mentioned the call to action. I generally recommend reply. And the two types of offers that I would recommend is first reply to schedule a call. So the email would actually come from one of your salespeople. <clears throat> so let's say it's bob at yourcompany.com and it would just be, you know, reply to this email <clears throat> and uh, reply to this email if you're interested and uh, we'll schedule a call. You know, something very um, <clears throat> conversational like that 
where it does look like that one-to-one -one email. It looks like something that someone would take the time to write and it's a natural call to action to just reply. And the other offer that we've seen works well is to reply to get free information. And we've tested this quite a bit where you can obviously just send an email and offer something for free and have them click an email. But we, ha we haven't seen great results from that. <clears throat> and my thinking, I, um, certainly, I, I don't know this for fact, but this is just based on my experience. My thinking is if you are sending cold email, again, the natural uh, progression would be for someone just to reply to the email. So I think when you're including a link, you're going against the grain in that sense. Plus, there's a lot of skepticism when you get an email from someone that you don't know. Um, there's a lot of fear and skepticism that uh, you're going to click on that link and it's going to take you to some you know crazy website where your your computer is going to get infected <clears throat> so there's a little bit of risk involved uh, with the person that's receiving that email uh, and that can be a, a tall hurdle depending on the demographic that you're targeting <clears throat> that is especially true if you're targeting the older demographic I know my mother for example is extremely cautious and will not click on anything and doesn't even update her her uh, computer, even though it's the computer saying she, she needs to update. She doesn't trust that. She's scared that she's going to get a virus. So just keep that in mind. If you're sending an email and you want someone to actually click a link, that is a, a fairly tall order when you're using cold email. So I generally recommend get them just to reply. So make that same exact offer. Maybe it's a, a, a free white paper <clears throat> showing how they can save, you know, X percent on their um, uh, on their payroll. Let's say you offer a payroll service. Um, you know, just just click reply and I'll shoot you over that report. Then you would get the reply, and then you would obviously ask for that call when you're sending the information. So it's basically a, it becomes a two-step process <clears throat> to get that sales call. All right, lastly here, I can't uh, talk about cold email without talking about the CAM spam laws. So the, the way the CAM spam laws work is you have to have a way to opt out. <clears throat> you can't just be blasting email lists without offering a way to opt out. That's, that's basically the, the short version of the CAM spam law. There are different options. You can say in your email, for example, you can draft your email with your signature and then in the, like, let's say the PS, say PS, just reply to let me know if you don't want me to follow up. That, it's really as simple as that and that allows that person to opt out. Or if you use a program like Constant Contact or MailChimp or uh, Infusionsoft, whatever email tool you're using, you could actually put an opt out link directly in the email. And this relates to a question I got before. If I would uh, recommend using <clears throat> an uh, email tool like Constant Contact or, or Infusionsoft, and I actually do not recommend that just because it doesn't look like a real email. It makes it very obvious if it has an opt-out link and it has that signature, this was sent by MailChimp, click here to opt out, right away, that person receiving the email, if they're savvy, they know that that was not a one-to-one -one email. Um, it was basically you know, a, a, an email blast or broadcast. So it, it kind of shows your cards a little bit and can put people on the defensive if they sense that uh, this was coming out. It's really a, a mass marketed offer versus that one-to-one -one email. <clears throat> and the last thing you'd wanna do is also include in your email, this can be in your signature, you wanna have your name, address, and phone number of the company. That's going to make sure, again, you're CAN-SPAM compliant. 
and it also gets you over that hurdle of showing that you are a legitimate business. <clears throat> and Rick, I'm going to get to your question in just a minute as far as automating. All right, so let's get into sending emails, which is related to automating the follow-ups. Okay, so people were already uh, <clears throat> jumping the gun here, thinking thinking ahead, which I like to see. You were worried about uh, your own domain and thinking through, you know, are you going to send this <clears throat> from your own uh, domain? And I mentioned before that it it can actually hurt your domain deliverability. So I don't recommend you use your main domain. I recommend you buy an alias domain. Um, I'm being a little bit harsh here by saying ruin your main domain deliverability. I don't expect anyone on the line is going to get crazy and spam the world. But if you did do that, it would ruin your main uh, domain deliverability. But regardless, whenever you're doing cold email outreach, there is risk. There is just risk that you're going to send something and a substantial number of the folks receiving it are going to be in a bad mood and they're going to be just annoyed that you emailed them. They're going to uh, flag it as spam. And again, if what happens when a uh, large percentage of your emails get flagged as spam, that gets sent to the ISP. And then the ISP, when it starts to see more emails from that particular domain, they just automatically throw those into spam folders. <clears throat> and that's what I mean by ruining your domain deliverability. So if you use your main domain, for example, ours is MainStreetROI.com, if I sent emails out from our main domain and a lot of people um, clicked spam, what could happen then is when we start communicating with customers and clients, our emails would automatically go into spam and we'd have a, a, a huge problem because we wouldn't be able to send emails. They'd, they'd all be going into people's spam folders. So that's, that's the problem. And the solution is pretty easy. We set up MainStreetROI.co and we do a lot of our our own uh, cold email outreach from the .co. So again, our main domain is .com, MainStreetROI.com, and we send cold email from .co. And uh, the whole reason for that is as simple as just keeping our main domain deliverability and just keeping our main domain clean. <clears throat> So I, I, I think that's the easiest way to do it. So if you have a .com, just create the, just go ahead and buy the .co. It's probably only gonna cost you uh, 10 or $15 a year. And that will uh, prevent any issues down the road. Uh, Mike asked, how do you get a, an alias domain? It's literally just a regular domain that you would buy at GoDaddy or wherever you bought your domain originally. You can just reach out to that uh, domain registration or registrar and see if they have other variations of your main domain. For example, if you have a .com, you can go with the .co. Um, I think previously we ha we might have had Main Street and Street was just ST so that it was mainstroi.com. So you, that would be a, another variation that we could use. Uh, so you, it's just a matter of going to a domain registrar and uh, finding a variation of your domain. You want it to look very similar because you're going to reach out with those. Then when people reply, you're then going to use your main email, just your regular email. <clears throat> So you, you want that to be as seamless as possible. That's why the .co, I think, works very well. Nobody really notices that uh, that first email is going out with .co, and then we reply with a .com. <clears throat> All 
and uh, somebody brought up the question of follow uh, automating follow-up emails the tool that I, I definitely recommend is Yesware and uh, it, they have a free 30-day trial and uh, that means if you time this up right you do all the steps one through four and then you're ready to send the emails <clears throat> you could go get a free trial and uh, and probably do a, do a round of outreach with a free trial and, and not even uh, spend any money. Now, obviously, if you were going to do this a lot, you would have to bite the bullet, and it's three hundred dollars a year. <clears throat> but that is by far the best tool. <clears throat> the second best tool, if you want to save some money, and there's uh, just a monthly plan for Reply Up, which is nice. Uh, so it's about half the cost on a yearly basis, plus if you're only going to do this for a couple months, it would make more sense to just use Reply Up. The problem is it's it's a little more clunky to use and uh, their support is not great. So Yesware is, is basically the Cadillac of the tools available that, that we've used and Reply Up is uh, is, is basically a, a beater car. It still gets the job done. It gets you from point A to point B, but uh, it's it's pretty clunky. So as you can tell, I don't really recommend Reply Up, but if you don't have the budget, definitely it's it's worth using. The reason I recommend these tools is for that question previously, as far as automating. That was from Rick. Uh, these tools allow you to put the email sequence into the tool. And then when you uh, start sending the emails, if someone replies, the tool actually tracks that and takes those people off of the follow-up emails. So let's say you have a three email sequence. You send that first one and someone replies. You don't want that person to get the, the next two emails. So the program automatically stops the the, the next two emails for that person that replied, and then everyone else that did not reply <clears throat> gets those follow-up emails automatically. So that's why these, these tools are great. <clears throat> All right, so I've been talking about email outreach. There's actually a very effective alternative to email and it's to use website contact forms. <clears throat> and this sounds ridiculous, at least I thought it sounded ridiculous, but we decided, hey, let's just give it a shot because most, most websites have a contact form and it's very easy to get that. <clears throat> it's, it's much harder to identify an email and start sending emails or much more expensive to go buy emails from a, from a broker. So rather than do that, we tested using contact forms. And it worked <clears throat> ridiculously well. <laughs> it, it outperformed uh, our expectations. And I thought about this more, and I think this is why it works. So when you think about it, uh, <clears throat> when you send emails, I already mentioned some of those emails go into spam folders. <clears throat> they just get filtered automatically. Um, but with contact forms, you basically get nearly 100% deliverability. <clears throat> Every business wants to know when someone submits something on their contact form. They, they, you know, you, you work hard with your IT and your web developers to make sure those messages get delivered to you. So they don't, they don't get filtered. And oftentimes in a lot of businesses, it's someone's job to get those messages and then route those to the appropriate person. So it's literally that person's job to not ignore those emails. And uh, when you think about that, so it's it's basically, it would be going, uh, they'd be doing a bad job if they got that message and then just ignored it. <clears throat> but if I sent a cold email to that same person directly to them, they have really no obligation to do anything with that email because it was just it's sent directly to them personally. But when something comes through a contact form to the company, it's kind of like the company's property, and they they feel that obligation to move that 
company property through the company to the appropriate person. So <clears throat> I don't know if that's true. Intuitively, that makes sense to me. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that contact forms do in fact work. Um, the problem obviously is you don't, you don't have a, a follow-up sequence. So it's really just one and done. You would go through your list of businesses you would uh, identify their websites, identify their contact form pages, and then you would submit the contact form message. You just fill out that form as if you were writing an email <clears throat> and, uh, uh, j and just click submit and then it goes. And then you don't have any way to automatically follow up. <coughs> now with that in mind, I wanna go through my recommended, what I call advanced three-step outreach sequence. From easiest to hardest, you do your research, you find the businesses that you wanna contact, and then I recommend you start with contact forms. You can just get that done. It's the easiest thing you can do. It doesn't require um, uh, you know, a lot of work, upfront work to research. And again, most of the businesses that you research are going to have a website contact form. So you can get that done pretty quickly. Then, <clears throat> if you're not going to buy a list, then I would recommend just going again down that list of, of businesses, finding the generic company email address that's listed on the, uh, it's usually listed on the contact page of the website. Reach out to that email. <clears throat> so again, the goal here is just to go from easiest to hardest, see how many responses you can get, and then any any of the businesses that don't follow up, don't reply, then you got to go to this third step, which is to find individual people at the company and do some some harder research to actually find those contacts' email addresses. <clears throat> All right, step six. Now you've you've sent your messages. Let's just say you're doing email and you have a follow up sequence going. You're gonna to start to get replies. You obviously wanna to reply to the positive replies as soon as possible. Those are, are you know, pretty hot leads at that point. And then you also need to manage your list. So I recommend using a Google spreadsheet <clears throat> for your list. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and you wanna document both the positive replies as well as the negative replies. And you need to keep this all organized so that uh, in the future you don't follow up with anyone that uh, replied negatively. Because your email sequence, let's say it's three emails, you're going to run that sequence, maybe it lasts two weeks. And uh, after that, those that list that you found is not totally dead you might wanna follow up with them with a different message and a different sequence, but you wouldn't wanna follow up with anyone that, that said no, because then you're getting into uh, you know, obviously spamming those people. All right, lastly, what can you expect? So here's a, a quick case study, just based on uh, a recent campaign that we did at Main Street RI. We researched web design firms 116 of them, and we sent the message to form a partnership. Uh, obviously, that's a pretty pretty good uh, synergy there with a web design company that builds websites. <clears throat> then those businesses need marketing services. You know, there's an obvious uh, relationship there that we could form. So we reached out to them with a message to form that kind of partnership and we got 12 to reply positively, which backs out to about a 10% response rate. So that's pretty strong. That's definitely on the strong end. Um, <clears throat> you can basically <laughs> expect anywhere from zero, because <clears throat> we have struck out before, um, to, to uh, on the higher end is, is really 10 to, uh, I think the highest we saw was around 12%. <clears throat> and obviously response rates are going to vary greatly depending on your offer, but also the quality of your list. So 
So if you do a poor job in uh, <clears throat> those early steps of identifying who you want to target and and uh, and just building a, a, a poorly targeted list, then that's not going to have a, a strong response rate. But if you get <clears throat> really uh, specific with who you want to target and actually do that research and find those businesses that meet your criteria and then put together a, a compelling offer for them, then you can you can get some uh, some good response rates. I would I would say in the neighborhood of two to ten percent is uh, is a good goal. All right, so here's the checklist. What we walk through: step one, identify your criteria. <clears throat> step two, build your list. And you have two options: research or buy it. Then you want to segment your list. Then you want to draft those email sequences for each segment. Then you want to send those emails. Or else I mentioned you can use contact forms and then you want to reply and keep your list updated. <clears throat> That's a pretty straightforward offer here. Uh, if you are interested in uh, running cold outreach campaign <clears throat> and you're already in business, you want to launch a campaign in the next 60 days, you want to generate leads, for B2B or form partnerships. And uh, lastly, if you, know, if, you, if you have some actual credibility, that is key. I'm, I tried to emphasize that early on, that that's one of the biggest hurdles with cold email. Uh, people are going to receive these emails and they wanna know pretty quickly, <clears throat> you know, are you a legitimate business? Do you have any credibility? And if you don't, that's gonna make it uh, pretty difficult to make this work. So if you are interested and you meet that criteria, I'm going to show a poll. <clears throat> so on your screen, you should see a poll with the options of yes, no, uh, no, I do not need any help at this time, or no, but I'm interested in your other services. And I see some responses coming in. Get uh, let me get five more seconds here. Three, two, one. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna close that out. All right, and we've got live Q and A. Let me check the time. Got about seven minutes here. Let me just get back up to the top here, see if I missed anything. <clears throat> all right, I think I answered most of these, or all of these. <clears throat> all right, so Callie, I did address your questions there as far as using constant contact and including a unsubscribe. <clears throat> uh, Daphne had a question here. Instead of just a sender name, have a name and a company name as the sender. In case they don't recognize the name, they'd know it's so-and-so from ABC Company. Is that better or just use Jane Doe? Especially in the beginning, they have no idea who Jane Doe is. <clears throat> That's a great question, Daphne. And I I would actually recommend just the person's name, so Jane Doe in this case, <clears throat> versus Jane Doe dash company. Because uh, again, it's related to this <clears throat> concept of banner blindness, but a applying it to email. When people see emails coming in and the sender name is from a company or it's from a name dash company, it kind of triggers right away this uh, reaction that we can safely ignore that email, it's not important. Whereas if the email is coming from a person, Jane Doe, and it's got a compelling subject line, it looks like that is a, a real email and it deserves some attention and I should actually open it up. Uh, 
uh, Ryan had a question. What about domains that are linked to? <clears throat> Is this limited to the domains within the sender's email address? Okay, so I believe, Ryan, you're saying, <clears throat> what if you're sending an email and it links to your main uh, email address, is that going to hurt your deliverability? <clears throat> Generally, what I, I recommend is you, you send the email from that domain alias and you don't, um, and you don't link to your, your main website in your email. So it would just be a text email. Um, and again, that call to action would just be to reply that's what I've seen works best. <clears throat> and I would need to double check your specific question as far as, let's say you sent it from a domain alias, but then linked to your main domain. <clears throat> My initial thinking is that, that that would not hurt your main domain. Um, because if that would be the case, it would actually be easy to kind of um, uh, do that to competitors. <laughs> I could send a bunch of spam with <clears throat> competitor links in it to hurt their domain. So I don't think uh, that would have an impact, but I, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then Ryan asks, have you seen drops in performance due to the change in domain? <clears throat> I have not split tested domains um, in a in a given list. So I, I don't know with certainty if changing MainStreetRI.com to MainStreetRI.co, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, <coughs> had a, a negative impact. I don't, if it did, it's very negligible. Uh, and then Ryan also asked, do you have any experience data on cold emailing and double initial opt-in? So double opting in would be something you're doing on your website. So if you're not familiar with double opt-in, that would be the process where, let's say, you have a free report on your website. Someone requests that free report. You then send them an email that says, hey, you have to opt in to get this free report. Then they have to click that link. And that's basically the second time they're opting in to get that report. So it's a, a double opt-in. <clears throat> a lot of email programs push for double opt-ins because obviously if someone double op opts in, they jump through two hoops. They are they they're they're familiar with your business. It's you know a, a real person. That's the best email address that you could have on your list. With that said, uh, the email service providers also aren't, aren't trying to make you the most money. And the reality is going through the hoops of double opting in is put, it puts your uh, prospective clients and customers, um, you know, it makes them jump through two hoops, uh, makes them really work for whatever it is you're trying to offer. So you're naturally going to lose some legitimate prospects if you use double opt-in. So what I generally recommend is to use double opt-in, but don't force it. So, <coughs> excuse me, what that means is if they requested something on your site, send them an email and then have that link that they click, just say, you know, click here to get your uh, free report and they don't even really know they're double opting in. <coughs> But if they click it, they do double opt in, that's great. If they don't click it, that's fine too. You've got a single opt in and you can still follow up with those folks. So basically use single opt in to, to ensure that you're not losing legitimate prospects, but um, you can incorporate the double opt in links in your marketing to basically um, uh, get people to that status of double opting in, which is what your email service provider is going to want you to do. Hopefully that clarified that particular question. Um, let's 
see here. Daphne said, I think it gets routed, but the person may still not reply after reading. Oh, that's referred to, uh, referring to the contact forms. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I, I do realize, you know, your response rates are definitely not going to be 100% with contact forms, but I do think the deliverability is nearly 100%. So you're actually going to get it in front of more people <clears throat> versus just using email. Uh, Keenan asked, what is an example of a website contact form? If you go to MainStreetROI.com, in the top navigation on the right, it says contact or contact us. Click on that. <clears throat> and then on that page is a form. And that's what I'm referring to when I say contact form. <clears throat> Jenna. Uh, as far as the email tools, I recommend Yesware and Reply Up. Joe said, "How many emails are you sending to the cold outreach contacts, and over what time frame?" That varies greatly. Uh, <clears throat> so, if you're researching and compiling your own lists, the the limiting factor is how quickly you can research and compile those lists. Um, and you can see the example I gave was only 112, I think, businesses. So we did, um, <coughs> I think what happened there was we researched 112 over the course of a week and then sent them the following week. Um, and that was just the nature of how long it took to research and, and get that all ready. If you buy a list from a broker, you might instantly get 1,000, 2,000 contacts in which case you could just send a thousand or two thousand right away. Uh, Thomas said, "When and where do you recommend using an Aweber and FusionSoft Mailchimp tool?" So, yes, exactly. As far as your your in-house list, email marketing. So, when you think of traditional email marketing, at least I think of an email newsletter. You're sending email promotions to a list of contacts who have opted in. <clears throat> so you have this list that you're nurturing, and that's where I would use a tool, an email service provider like Aweber, Infusionsoft, or MailChimp. <clears throat> Joe asked, does hitting reply count as a click? It's a great question because I forgot to mention, uh, when people reply to emails, <clears throat> that is a positive signal for the ISP, which improves your future deliverability. So that's another reason why I, I highly recommend using the reply as the call to action, because it's basically getting people to engage with your emails. And when people engage with your emails, that's a positive signal, which then improves deliverability, which means less of your emails are going to go into spam folders. So Daphne, as far as B2C businesses, um, I would recommend using cold outreach to form partnerships. So you'd want to find other businesses who already um, offer products and services to your ideal customer. And then you can use cold outreach to form a partnership with those businesses, whether it's reciprocal or one way. <clears throat> Um, you know, that, that depends on the, the situation, but obviously if it can be reciprocal, that's a, a easier um, sell to that potential partner. Uh, or if it's one way, then you'd probably be looking at paying out referral commissions. <clears throat> okay, I have a long question here. So Ryan, you mentioned you, you like the ability to track opens. So Yesware is going to track your opens for you. So even though it's an, it looks like a text email, it actually is HTML. And there is a little image pixel that you know no one can actually see. You know, it's like a white image on a white background. <clears throat> and that's how those uh, uh, 
the email tracking works. So when that when they open up the email, it opens up that tracking uh, image pixel, and then that sends a signal back to the email program that that email was in fact opened. <clears throat> so long story short, Ryan, you would still get the uh, the open rate uh, tracking. Uh, Jeff, you said you've had trouble with uh, buying lists. Let me see if I can uh, quickly find. Let me just open up this and quickly go to the slide. <clears throat> Where is it? It was in uh, building your list. The company we've used and would recommend is mountaintopdata.com. Uh, Joseph, I have, I don't think I've ever used Contact Monkey, so I don't have an opinion on that tool, sorry. And uh, we're a little bit over here. I did get through all the questions. Just to wrap up, um, uh, we have a Master Your Marketing series coming up on October 26th. What is that, next uh, Thursday? <coughs> Any subscribers to our newsletter will get an invite. And if you're not on our list, you can go to MainStreetMarketingTips.com to get on our newsletter. And then uh, I do encourage everyone to complete a brief survey. When I close this webinar, you should get automatically redirected to the survey. I think there's four, maybe five questions just to get your feedback on this particular training and then ideas for future trainings. So with that, I'm going to close it up and I uh, hope you do complete that survey and I hope to see you next Thursday for our Master Your Marketing series. All right, take care, everyone.